Oh yes, this is something that quite a number of you have asked me to do over the years and deep down like I've wanted to do it too but always found an excuse not to do it or you know kind of looked at it and said hey I need to make sure that I can prioritize my schedule enough to allow for enough time to be able to actually watch all of these shows, to be able to actually review all of these shows within the month that makes sense. But I've always wanted to do a King of the Ring review series, and I teased this on Twitter on Monday, said, hey, today I'm watching King of the Ring 1993 and 1994, and, well, why would I be doing that? And a couple of you got it, a lot of you didn't. Um, but yes, it's true. I am doing a King of the Ring review series here in the month of June. Today kicks off the first one with King of the Ring 1993, and I'll be going up all the way through, what is it, 2002? So 10 of these Jokers this month, so should be enough time for me to be able to watch all 10 shows and review all 10 of the shows. With that, make sure that you follow the show on Twitter, so that way, you know, if you miss something from me, you can catch it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. Let's go ahead, though and talk about King of the Ring 1993. King of the Ring is a concept, a show that I really miss. Like some might make an argument that Money in the Bank kind of replaced it, but to me the Money in the Bank concept was a different swing basically at doing a similar thing of what you did with King of the Ring. Furthermore, I look at Money in the Bank and I still look at that and I say that should be a match that you have at WrestleMania. That's what that should be. King of the Ring should be a yearly pay-per-view. Because it's a chance to showcase some of your next up type of guys. Give guys a focus, give guys a push, give guys a time. You know, you can give a break to some of your other bigger names for the pay-per-view because the concept of the King of the Ring and the King of the Ring tournament is what matters most. It's something you could build into your Raws and your Smackdowns, maybe even your NXTs, because you sit there and say you can have a King of the Ring qualifier series. You know, you could do any of that. You could sit there damn near and do a King of the Ring for Raw and Smackdown. Maybe it's Raw versus Smackdown shit, and you could have NXT do a takeover show as well that is King of the Ring. Like You do so many different things with it. I really wish this concept was still around for WWE as a pay-per-view. Like, it was the fifth of their big pay-per-views, and I don't know why the fuck they ever went away from it. Vince got bored with the concept, maybe at one point it wasn't doing the best pay-per-view buys, whatever, but damn it, I miss this concept, and I wish it was still a thing. Let me know in the comments if you agree with me on that. Your commentary team for the night was JR, the Macho Man, and Bobby the Brain Heenan, and what an eclectic group this was. Well, you go back and you watch a show like this, like obviously makes you miss uh, the Macho Man and the Brain. Weasel, weasel, but you, you, you miss these guys. You remember how great these guys were um, and how much energy they provided to the commentary team. Now, obviously, the combination of JR, Macho Man, and Heenan, they had done WrestleMania 9 in Vegas and they did this pay per view. Um, I mean, it's not one of the best commentary teams in WWF history, but certainly was a fun and entertaining one nonetheless. And one of the things that really stands out to you as you're watching these shows is how Mach was clearly on the babyface side and he would cheerlead for the baby faces and what was for, for what was right, whereas Bobby the Brain Heenan brought the element of cheering for the heels and making justifications and excuses for them and pumping them up. Like everybody had a role and they played it and they played it so well. We really miss that in today's commentary. I re really, really do. Uh, but anyways, King of the Ring 1993, you were going to have four quarterfinal matches, up to two semifinal matches, and then the main event of the show was obviously going to be the King of the Ring tournament final. And, you know, remember the first round matches have 15-minute time limits, and if you wrestle to a draw or a double disqualification, then neither guy advances, and the guy that they would have faced gets a bye into the finals which is exactly what happened here. More on that in a moment. Well, when you look at the card, like your quarterfinal matches, you had Razor Ramon versus Bret Hart, which was a follow-up you know, to what they, wasn't it Royal Rumble 93 that they fought for the WWF title? Now here they are in the quarterfinal round of King of the Ring. Good solid match between the two of them. The Mr. Perfect versus Mr. Hughes quarterfinal match is probably most notable for 
uh, the thing that you've seen all these times over the years where Mr. Perfect takes the towel and flips it behind his back and it lands on Mr. Hughes' shoulder. That's easily the most notable thing about this, and a lot of you probably don't even realize that that came from something like King of the Ring 93, but it did. This is okay, but this was all tying into the Harvey Whippleman stuff, and Giant Gonzalez and The Undertaker, and Mr. Hughes had the frickin' urn. Mr. Hughes ends up getting disqualified, and Mr. Perfect advances, which led to some good back and forth, I guess, between Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect ahead of their semifinal match, because during the match, like Bret had said that he preferred endurance versus the strength and size of Mr. Hughes, so he was going to go with Mr. Perfect, who he had already beaten. And I like the dynamic of how this played out, like you have babyface versus babyface in the interview before the semifinal match. Like, it was kind of disconjointed a little bit, but you got the point. But it was a good reminder, too, to me of, like, I don't know in terms of legends or big, big-time stars if there was ever one that was worse on the mic than Bret Hart from 93 to 96, he was terrible. He was god-awful, and you could tell. He was trying to act. He was trying to recall. He was not comfortable. It showed. And then when you look at that and you compare that to 1997 Teen Canada, I get to be a whiny, bitchy, selfish-ass Canadian crybaby, and it came natural to him because it was real, because that's who the fuck he was. Like... Team Canada, Brett, 1997 was fantastic. One of my favorite years for a wrestler ever. So this weird dynamic of how, you know, those years where he was one of the leaders of the new generation, if you will, and yet all the while, it's 97 is the year that I remember the most because that was when he was the most natural, which is a lesson to learn for everybody is the closest you could be to your real self, it comes more natural, it will come across in your character and especially on the microphone. Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, and Bam Bam Bigelow was one of the quarterfinal matches. Really not all that memorable. Bam Bam Bigelow wins. The real surprise to me going back and watching this is the fact that they had the narcissist Lex Luger and Tatanka, the undefeated Tatanka, and they went a 15-minute Broadway. <laughs> and when you go back and look at this, like at the time Tatanka was the big thing about how he was undefeated, and then you've got the narcissist Lex Luger, but... You turn around a few weeks later, here you go on the 4th of July, if you remember, it's Lex Luger on the Lex Express that came to body slam Yokozuna on the aircraft carrier. Like, it's crazy to me how quickly they shifted away from this narcissist gimmick, and they went with this instead. And you could even say there was a little bit of a tease of that potentially coming when the narcissist got on the mic, and he asked for five more minutes after the 15-minute draw, and it's not the way it worked. So basically, what happened was, you had Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect win, so that sets up one semifinal, and then Bam Bam got the buy into the final because the narcissist and Tatanka uh, had a draw. Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect obviously wasn't SummerSlam 91 quality, but still solid, still good. Um, you know, one of those types of mid card matches that you wish you know that you could see more out of professional wrestling, where these guys took bumps and stuff but they actually tried to build up to those bumps and they sold shit and moves had consequences and significance and these guys actually were able to craft and tell a story. This is the type of stuff you go back and watch and you say, God, I miss this type of wrestling. Uh, what was really strange to me though about this was that the WWF Championship match between Yokozuna and Hulk Hogan was buried in the middle of the fucking show. Like, I understand it not being the main event, and I agree fundamentally with the King of the Ring tournament final should be the main event of the show because the damn show is named the King of the Ring. That said, it's really weird that you had an eight-man tag and the Intercontinental Championship match go on after the WWF Championship. It's almost like Hulk Hogan's like, I'm going to drop this to Yoko. I want to get the fucks out of the way so that way nobody remembers because they'll focus on the shit at the end of the night. Typical Hogan crap there. Uh, but... You can even, when you go back and watch, and you know how it played out 28 years later, but when you go back and watch, like the, the cameraman that played a big part in the flash bur bulb burning in Hogan's eyes and leading to Yokozuna winning and becoming the new WWF champion, like, it was just so fucking obvious. Like, why did they make it so damn obvious? Like, the guy in the hat and the trench coat and the fake beard and everything. Like, why did they do that? I don't know. Um, but even in this match, like, this is obviously Hogan on his way out of the company. Yoko's really starting to come into the fold, come into his own. He's just really kind of the peak of Yoko at the height of his powers and uh, skills. 
Uh, yeah, God damn, Yoko was really good. And even with the this match a little bit, like, it wasn't a pure work of art, and a lot of younger fans certainly would not enjoy it because it's not the type of wrestling they're used to or become accustomed to. But even this match told the story where Hogan couldn't just get Yokozuna down. Yoko couldn't be body slammed by Hogan. Like, they worked off of Hogan's strength, but also Hogan, you know, giving up a lot of size to Yokozuna. It's also a good reminder post-match when you hear Mr. Fuji, you're like, ah, now I remember why Jim Cornette was made the American spokesperson because you never knew what the fuck Mr. Fuji was going to say. Not from an unpredictability standpoint, but legitimately like you didn't know what the fuck Mr. Fuji was saying. So they had to give somebody that could make coherent sense. That's later on down the road when you get to 1994 and Yoko has James E. Cornette as his American spokesperson. You had an eight-man tag that was just kind of there. It does feature the Steiners and the corny-ass smoking guns. You had an Intercontinental Championship match featuring Crush and Shawn Michaels. It's a shame still not doing the show with Tony because I would love to hear him rant and bitch about Crush for a moment or two. Um, but it was an okay match. Nothing really spectacular. And then you get to the King of the Ring Tournament Final, and it's Bam Bam Bigelow versus Bret Hart. And this match was good. Very good. Not great. Not legendary. But, you know, when I go back and watch a match like this with Bret Hart and I watch his work throughout this night with Razor and Mr. Perfect and Bam Bam Bigelow, he had three different matches with three different wrestlers that all played up to the strengths and assets of those other wrestlers. And, you know, it's one of those things you go back and you look and you're like, you really respect Bret. And I appreciate him more sometimes as the years go by. Now, there are some things I never really liked about him. Like I said, during the 93 to 96 era, his um, mic work was the absolute drizzling shits. I always thought the Hitman character was kind of dumb, personally. Um, and I, I never really liked the fact, from a storytelling standpoint, that his facials always seemed to be largely the same. But what I always did appreciate about Brett, when you talk about the excellence of execution, was... How every move seemed to have purpose. Every move flowed together. Every move had meaning. Like, even when you talk about running into the turnbuckle, like, that's a Bret Hart spot. And he made that shit look legit, and then, by God, he actually fucking sold it. What a novel damn concept. And he played up to Bam Bam Bigelow's strengths. Talk about Bam Bam's size and his great athleticism. And, and you look at this show like this, and again, if anything else, it just stands out. Like, even as you were getting into this new generation era, which is frankly, a rough era for WWE, still a reminder, they had some really good talent and they had some talent that in today's world would absolutely be megastars by comparison. Um, both Bam Bam and Bret Hart certainly would have been. Mr. Perfect would have been. Razor Ramon sure as hell would have been. Um, you know, Bam Bam was a badass, man. Bam Bam looked legit. The fucking flame tattoo in his goddamn head and this big dude that could go off the top rope. Like, hell fucking yeah. But I always thought it was really weird. Like, you have this, and Bret Hart ends up going on to win the King of the Ring, even though you get, when didn't we get the interference here from Luna and all of that? Um, but then we get to the coronation session, and here comes Jerry Lawler, and he's trying to get Bret to kiss his feet, and it's like, oh, God. Going back and watching it, that's how starved they were for talent. They were sitting there and getting into that working business relationship with Memphis and Jerry Lawler, and they were bringing Lawler in. He was going to be part of the WWF fold. And, man, did they push him to the fucking moon. <laughs> I think they overplayed and overvalued just how much he could bring as an on-screen performer and an in-ring talent. Like, he was in some really cringeworthy shit <laughs> in the mid-'90s. He really, really was, if you go back and watch. See my, sir, my King of the Ring 1994 review to talk more about that. Uh, but I, with this show, like I said, it was solid. Certainly wasn't great, but this is just like a formality, a piece of exercise that I've got to do because I tell you what, by God, the next King of the Ring, I can't wait to fucking talk about a main event disaster for the ages and Art Donovan and all of his resplendent glory on commentary. How much does that guy weigh? Do you play football? And I especially can't wait to make the case for my very unpopular but very accurate opinion how Art Donovan's performance on commentary at King of the Ring 1994 was not the drizzling shits, 
but I think it was refreshing and actually a really good thing and not just because it was like train wreck bad. But more on that in the King of the Ring 1994 review. You will not want to miss that. With that, I am out. Let me know if you've ever watched King of the Ring 1993, what your memories of it are, what you liked or didn't like about the show. Um, that's all I got for now. Peace.